name of Jesus. It's that time of the day again, and it is still the state of the union. That time when we look at issues pertaining to the union between Jesus and his bride, the church. And we have been looking at various possibilities as to why he would have to say, tell my people to return to me. So we have been looking at a couple of possibilities delivered to me a couple of days ago. Today we'll make it the sixth day. So today we will be looking at number six in this series. We will be looking at number six in this series. And as usual, we will start by reading from the scriptures. And today's reading is taken from Matthew chapter six. Matthew the sixth chapter. And it says, <clears throat> from verse 19, and I need you to pay close attention, or perhaps later, you can look it up yourself and consider the things written there, perhaps particularly in the light of what I'm about to set forth. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Lay not up for yourselves, treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rot, rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thy eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, what you shall eat, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit or unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or, with, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, even as I prepared for 
this moment, and I decided to read from verse 19. There was something I didn't see until we began to read it just now. In verse 26, it says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they do not sow, neither do they reap or gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Then it goes on in verse 27, it says, Which of you by... Okay, well, not that. Um, the other one which says that they toil not. Said, consider the lilies of the valley. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, verse 28. They toil not, neither do they spin. This is a reference to effort. It says they don't sow. It says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they do not sow, neither do they reap nor gather into ground. Who taught us this principle about sowing and reaping as a principle for prosperity and getting ahead in life? Why is Jesus apparently debunking it here? Yes, if you sow, you reap. What you sow, you harvest. That's true. But in those things, we are the speakers talking about prosperity and getting ahead in life. Because here, the master seems to be speaking against it. He says, Behold the fowls of the earth, for they don't sow, neither do they reap. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. So why do you think you have to reap, you have to sow and reap for you to have, or for the father to feed you? We have the same heavenly father who created us, created them. And Jesus is comparing their situation with ours. They don't sow and do, they don't reap. They don't gather into bands. Yet God makes sure that they are fed. How much better than they are we? Who told you that the way to get ahead in the name of prosperity, in the kingdom of God, is about sowing and reaping? Because that's what we've been taught in the last perhaps 30, 35, 40 years in the church. And this is why God is saying, tell my people to come back to me. God never taught us those things. Otherwise, why is he speaking against it here? Now, if you read the Bible carefully in the relevant places, you will see that he wasn't talking about getting ahead in life. Because here he says that the fowls of the air, of the air they don't gather into barns. The reason we are teaching sowing and reaping as a way of God is so that we can gather into barns. Yeah, Jesus is saying here, if your father feeds people who don't do that, uh, feeds the fowls of the air who don't do that, and you are better than them, why do you think that you have to employ the same principles or laws for you to get ahead? Who has deceived those thoughts? I said, I didn't even notice this when I was getting ready. I only saw it now as we read it. It's in line with what I want to talk about generally, but not, not, not that I want to start to quarrel with the prosperity message in, in itself. Because it runs afoul, anyway, of the things that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 6. He says, don't gather... <clears throat> Don't gather. He said, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth. That is gathering into bands. He said, don't do that. Don't gather into bands where corruption is likely to, to, to get to it. Where things are likely to get to it. He said, rather, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Then he goes on to say that you can't serve two masters. You can't be pursuing material gain and say you're pursuing God. Do you want me to speak English? They are antithetical, mutually exclusive. You can't pursue the two. You either hate one or hate the other. Or love one or hate the other or vice versa. That's what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 6 from verse 19. Don't lay treasures for yourself upon the earth. 
rather lay up treasures in heaven. Now you can't lay gold and silver in heaven. You can't even get there to put those things there. It's just even necessary. We're told that the streets of, gold, of, of, of heaven are paved with gold. So where did we get this thing from? Where did we get this thing from? Somebody obviously wanted to deceive us to run afoul of scripture by gathering, by laying up treasures for ourselves upon the earth. So, at the end of that reading, what do we have? Let me ask a couple of questions and then we move forward. Why do we seek to know these laws and principles and formulas? Gain. Gain. One advantage or the other. We want to acquire the well. We want to acquire, we want to gain the things that those laws or principles or formulas, what they portend, what they promise. We want to gain those things. Gain. That's the reason we seek laws, principles, and formulas. Gain. So I ask the question again. Why do we seek to know principles, formulas, laws, and things like that? And I introduce a second word. Acquisition. Acquisitions. That's the one Jesus talked about. Don't gather. Don't lay up for yourself. So the reason we have learned all these principles of prosperity or laws of prosperity, if you sow, you will reap. The reason we have learned those things, the reason we have been taught those things is acquisition. So that we can acquire and then so that we can gather. Contrary to what Jesus taught. He said, don't do that. If your father can feed the birds of the air, your father will feed you. He knows your problems. He will feed you. So the, one of the tenets of the kingdom can't be about sowing and reaping in the name of gathering. Gathering upon this earth is, it runs afoul to the principles of the kingdom of God. It can't be. You can't claim to exist in the kingdom of God or be pursuing the, the things of the kingdom of God and be gathering in this earth. Be seeking acquisitions. It's right there in Matthew chapter 6. Don't fight with me. Look at the scriptures. That's why I said perhaps later, we come back to and, and, and examine these things carefully. Gain. Acquisitions. That's what is at the back. Those are the things at the back of seeking to know principles, laws, formulas, all those things. Now, why do we want gain and acquisitions? Why do we want the things that these principles, laws, or formulas promise? Why do they want? Why do we want those things? Why do we want gain and acquisition? Because in these things there is a promise for tomorrow. We want to lay up things as a safeguard. We want to lay up things in view of tomorrow. And what is tomorrow? Now, today is Tuesday, um, I think the 21st of February, 2022. So tomorrow necessarily will be the 26th, Wednesday. Today is 22nd of February. Tomorrow necessarily will be Wednesday, the 23rd of February, 2022. Ordinarily. But tomorrow, in a larger sense, just means the future. So the things that we want to gain, the things that we want to acquire, they are for just this one purpose. We are already planning for tomorrow. We are seeking to lay something aside for the future. Why? We are seeking to solve problems which we imagine will come up tomorrow. We are seeking to make provisions for problems we imagine will come up tomorrow because the voices in this world, which
which we generally call experience, they have taught us that these problems will come up in the future. Now, for those who are joining us perhaps for the first time or in recent days, you may need to rewind and go back a week or two so you see the video where we dealt with the matter of the voices in this world. The voices in this world are programmed by the spirit of this world. They speak concerning the things of this world. But we are not of this world. So we are not supposed to be programmed or programmable by the spirit of this world or the voices in this world. We are supposed to be listening to the voice of voices that come from this world where we come from. So the voices of this world which speak of, in terms of experience, for example, tell us that you will need to pay school fees in a couple of weeks' time, or that you will need to pay house rent in a couple of weeks' time, or whatever it is, or that you will need to change your car, or some, one thing or the other, at some time in the near future. That's the voice of common sense, perhaps. So we, lay, we seek to lay up treasure. We seek to gain, to acquire, to gather in this earth so that we will have material provision for these problems of tomorrow. But I say to you, in the name of tell my people to return to me, you cannot seek to solve tomorrow's problem today and claim to be living in faith. Why? The God of faith says, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't plan, don't lay up treasure for tomorrow. Now, if you do, you run afoul of his teaching. So you can't be in alignment with him. I'm not saying these things of myself. We just read them from the scriptures. Don't worry about tomorrow. And you know what Jesus said? He said the Gentiles, the people of this world, worry about such things. Tomorrow can be five minutes from now. The point is that it is future from this moment. Don't worry about that. Your father knows that that need with them, so that you have such things. He'll take care. Yes, look, hey. I'm just in this world as anybody else. So I understand the pressures which come at us left, right, and center, up and down. I do. But we must return to the Lord and begin to adjust our thinking in line with the righteousness of God, in line with the tenets of the kingdom of God, in line with the thinking of God's kingdom and God's righteousness. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 32, 33. But first he said that worrying about the situations or the issues of this world and therefore seeking to gather, lay up treasure for, for, for those problems, he said that's a situation with the Gentiles. Gentiles meaning those outside of God's house. Today that would be non-church. Before it was non-Jew. So why do we want to gain an acquisition? Because we want to lay off things for tomorrow. We are seeking to solve problems which we imagine, or which the voices in this world, which we call experience, have taught us that they will come up in the future. You cannot seek to solve tomorrow's problem today and claim to be with it. No, sir. No, ma'am. You can't do that. You can't be running helter skelter about tomorrow's problem when it hasn't even come. Who told you tomorrow's problem will come? Is it God or the voice in this world? You sort that out. So I often ask people, what has God said? Hey, look, sometimes I'm guilty too. But the issue is, what has God said concerning that thing that you are worrying about? What has God said? He said in, 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 he said, in all these things that we want to worry about, he said, present them to God with thanksgiving. 
and the peace of God will suffuse your heart. That's what he said. Now that's where we're supposed to be. Not worrying about the things of tomorrow to the point that we run afoul of God's word not to gather. Not to lay up treasure for ourselves. Because the reason we're laying up treasure is so that we will use it tomorrow to meet tomorrow's needs. You cannot seek to solve tomorrow's problem today and claim to live in faith. For faith casts all her cares upon the Lord, knowing and trusting that the Lord cares. The problem is, do you know that the Lord cares? He says, come back to me so that we begin to redefine these things. Come back to me. He said, learn of me. To learn of him, you have to first of all come. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, having said all that, I come to today's meet, which is number six in our, in our series of seven, as earlier promised. So number six actually simply says, seek and preach, or if you like, add teach. Seek, preach, and teach God and his righteousness. And he will give you the tenets and principles which pertain to life. Now you will have a godly life. Not the one that looks like it, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. No, you will have a godly life because the life that you have will now be, how will I say it now? It will proceed forth from God. It will be an expression of God in and through you. Seek and preach formulas, principles, and laws, and you will get what they portend and promise. But to the exclusion of God. And that's where many of us are. We have been taught these principles. That's true. We have been taught these principles as solutions to life's problems. Mm -mm. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not principles and laws. I am the life. So if we come to him, we will get the life. And whatever he teaches us of principles and formulas or laws will be godly for us. And that's what Jesus was alluding to in Matthew 6, 23, when he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added. You see that? And all these things shall be added unto you. When they are added unto you, they will be godly. Your life will be a godly one. Because you didn't go after those things to the exclusion of God. Rather, you went after God. And in going after God, he adds those things to you. So the problem is not that, it's not whether or not God wants us to have things. No, of course, we, will have, we must have things. I'm talking from a studio now. I'm not talking from heaven, as it were. I'm talking from a studio. And a studio requires cameras and lights, for example. Those are things. We will need those things. So, of course, if you are planning to do a broadcast like this, you would need to have acquired the necessary infrastructure. That's true. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So when God first told me, eight months ago now that this series of broadcasts will happen. I didn't go running somewhere looking for the materials to do this. I just stayed with him waiting for the time. And in due course he sent somebody to bring everything that would be needed. Everything! Free! Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We have to come back to this matter. We have to come back to seeking the kingdom and the righteousness of God. We have to come back to the things we just read from Matthew chapter 6 that Jesus said. So long as our eyes are on the problems of tomorrow, we will seek ways and means to solve those problems beforehand. And then we would have stepped out of faith. And then we would be odious 
odious, foul smell to God. For which reason he says, come back. Return to me. Tell my people to return to me. We have to come back to brass tracks. The church must rediscover the old landmarks. The church must discover the apostolic doctrine. He thinks that we, you know, you know, in getting ready for this time, in, in the last couple of hours, I, 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 I realized something, or a thought occurred to me. I'm still processing it. When Paul said in, in Acts chapter 20 that he had led to the people the whole counsel of God and had held nothing back from them, what do you think he taught them? Do you think that Paul taught those people sowing and reaping to get, to get material? Do you think that Paul, Paul taught them the things that we are teaching today? He said, I have held nothing back. What do you think he taught them? Yes, so in a is in the Bible, but what was it in reference of? That's the issue. What was it in reference of? Well, once again, my time is up, and I must, uh, I must conclude this matter right away. But we will be here again tomorrow. We'll be here again tomorrow to take the concluding part of this series of seven. After which we will continue as we started originally in the business of tell my people to return to me as we study around the things which pertain to the matter of tell my people to return to me. The things for which God has found it necessary to send people like me out to call his people back to him. So we'll be back again tomorrow, same time. Long to you, baby.